Father, we do thank you this morning uh, that we can be reminded of the Lord's Prayer, which teaches us in such a simple but yet such a profound way how we are needing you, not only as our Lord, but also as our Father, because we've been adopted as your sons and daughters. And so, Lord, perhaps we haven't had a good father figure in our lives. Help us to see that you are our ultimate father, that you are the one that we can, that we can look to, that we can trust in. And even if we've had a good earthly father, Father, that we would know that he just pointed to you, Jesus. And so, Father God, we thank you this morning. May our eyes continually be fixed on you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, the kids are excused to go with, uh, to go to our children's church this morning. The Bible says, rejoice for those who rejoice, and um, at the risk of being a little bit uh, self-promoting this morning, and I don't want to be self-promoting, but um, I am excited because this past week, uh, this book came in the, in the mail uh, and this is the book that I had the privilege of being a part of. Uh, and it's called uh, Uma Nova Reforma. Após 500 anos de que ainda precisa mudar. Because basically what we're doing is we're celebrating 500 years of the Reformation. And so uh, Mundo Cristão, which is a Brazilian publisher, they asked me to write a contribution about my thoughts with respect to uh, the need for a new Reformation in a Brazilian church. As we know, there's a lot of issues in evangelicalism in Brazil, and, and so I had the privilege of being a part of this, and I, you know, the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, and so I know many of us don't read Portuguese, but if you do, um, you're welcome to pick this up at uh, any Christian bookseller and read my little chapter. I'm not sure it's so good, but um, I guess they thought it was good enough to include, so that's good news. Uh, but we're here this morning to focus on Jesus and to focus on his goodness. And so if you wouldn't mind opening your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 this morning, uh, we're going to continue reading in Philippians. Uh, for those of you who were not with us last week, uh, we basically talked about the idea of partnership in the gospel. How many of you were here last week? I, I believe most of you were, right? Right. We talked a lot about partnership with the gospel, this idea that Paul had a great affection for the church. He had a great affection for the church that he planted that started this kind of a ragtag group of, uh, of believers, uh, Lydia, which was actually the leader, uh, and her, her, her group of women that were meeting, as well as a jailer, as well as a woman that was formerly possessed by a demon. This was sort of the core group of Paul's church in, in Philippi. And so he, he was just writing from prison, and he was saying, I have a great affection for you guys. I love you guys. I love what the Lord is doing through you. And, he, and it was just an encouragement to all of us how we need to be partners in the gospel. And so, it, like I said, if you didn't listen to that message, I want to encourage you to listen to it this week. Well, today we're continuing on in Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to be starting at verse 12 this morning, verse 12. But before we read that text, I want to just talk a little bit about the fact that it's Father's Day. You see, there, there's, kind of a, there's kind of an unwritten saying among pastors, and it's this. Oftentimes what pastors end up doing with Mother's Day and Father's Day is this. On Mother's Day, we talk about how great the mothers are. We lift all of you up, we see how awesome you are, and you are, right? And then on Father's Day, we talk about how terrible the dads are, and we criticize you because you're not doing enough, and you're kind of short, and there's a lot of deadbeat dads out there, and how you need to change and get up to speed. That's kind of what a lot of churches do. Now, some of that may be true because I do believe that there's probably more awesome moms out there than there are awesome dads, to be honest. That's just my opinion. It's not like scientific. But... I do think there's still quite a few great dads out there, and they deserve encouragement. And so even if you don't consider yourself the greatest dad in the morning, I'm not going to beat you down in our message this morning. I'm going to encourage you uh, because, uh, because we all need to be encouraged this morning to grow. Now, so we all need to be convicted, not just dads, all of us. And as we look at the passage this morning... And everything that Paul has gone through and is going through, he's gone through a lot of suffering. Now, how, how many of you have experienced suffering in your life? 
How many of you have experienced suffering in your life? Okay, everybody. I mean everybody, you know. And, and I don't think there's anyone who hasn't experienced some moments of suffering. And I think it's, it's important to put our suffering in perspective, right? We have to be honest. The suffering that we face is not oftentimes the type of suffering that our brothers that are facing ISIS or ISIS in the Middle East would face. So there, we, we can't just say, my suffering is the same as this. Or the suffering that, you know... One of our friends in, in perhaps a, a wealthier country or a country that's more developed faces maybe a different kind of suffering than we, we have. I mean, for example, having your coffee not done the right way at Starbucks is not suffering. We know that. We know that. Now, however, I don't want to go overboard and relativize suffering to the point that only the people that are facing, you know, the Coptic Christians in Egypt are the only ones suffering in the world. Okay, because at the same time, we also need to realize that there's a relativeness to this, that we too suffer, we too go through hard times, and if you're going through a hard time this morning, the good news is that God is with you, and the good news is that your suffering can be for a purpose, and so the choice for us this morning is this, is our suffering going to be with a purpose, or is it going to be without a purpose? Are we going to use our suffering for God's glory, or are we going to use it to merely wallow and in, in, in complain? And so the Apostle Paul is convicting in this aspect, because he wrote this book in the midst of suffering, and he suffered a lot. But the question remains, how do we respond to suffering? One of the greatest challenges that we face as Christian men, as Christian women, is the threat of our confidence in the goodness of God when life takes a bad turn, when things don't go in a good direction, when we have to suffer. Again, will our suffering be with purpose or will it be without purpose? That's the question I want to bring before us this morning. Now, Paul was what we call a man's man. Okay, he was a man's man. I, I don't want to, you know, get all machista this morning, but he was a man's man. He was the kind of guy that's dealt with all kinds of difficult situations. He's writing this book from prison. He's writing about his incredible partnership in the gospel. He's writing about the affection. He's keeping tabs on all the people, as we talked about last week. He's taking notes as where, where are people. He's greeting people. He's ministering even to the prisoners. But you have to consider everything that Paul has been to been through up to this point. And so it's not just the fact that he's in prison suffering, it's everything he's been through. He's been through the worst, and God planned it that way. It's as if nothing went right for the Apostle Paul, but because it was a part of God's plan, everything went right at the end of the day. At the end of the day, everything went right because it was all a part of, of God's plan. So let me remind you just some of what Paul went through from his writings in his very own words. For we do not want you to be ignorant brothers, fellow Christians, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. In, indeed, we felt that we had, been, we had received the sentence of death. Then he goes on to say... We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but, not, but now destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Then he goes on to say, as servant of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in calamities, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, in labors, in sleepless nights, hunger by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right and for the left hand. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. And so Paul is this kind of man's man. He handles suffering, quite frankly, better than probably most of us could. 
I mean, the guy was single, but he was a man's man. In terms of manliness, he's an example for all of us as fathers. He could never be accused as being the kind of guy that was in his parents' basement just kind of playing video games all day. And that wasn't the Apostle Paul. He wasn't lazy. He was relentlessly focused on his work and on his people. And he would do whatever was necessary for the cause of the gospel, even if that meant suffering. Now, let me give you just one more example here. He goes on to be very specific about the kind of suffering he faces when he talks about false teachers. And he says this, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, with more imprisonments, with countless beatings, near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews 40 lashes, the less one. I've always kind of wondered, why did they always have to mention the less one, you know, but... Anyway, I was beaten with rods three times. I was stoned once. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys. I in danger from rivers, from robbers, from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea. It's a little bit like living in Rio sometimes, right? You don't know where you can go. <laughs> Anytime you're in a wooded area, you're like, is someone going to come out and get me? Okay, so we can experience a little bit of what Paul... <laughs> Danger from false brothers, they're all over the place. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety of all the churches, which, believe it or not, probably weighed on him more than anything. Who is weak and I am not weak? The daily pressure that's on him, the anxiety he has for all the churches. You know, what happened in the past two days in Virginia, for those of you who've kind of been tracking what's going on in the states with the racial tension, is tragic. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I rarely post uh, uh, about these issues, but I posted something yesterday on Facebook saying that this is evil. And this is something that Christians need to stand up and pastors need to stand up and say it's evil. Because there's an anxiety for us as pastors sometimes when we see these kinds of situations and God calls us to speak out. Who is weak and I am not weak? We have to identify with those who are going through suffering. And there's many in the states that are going through suffering because of that tension. And it's not just there. There's many going through suffering here in Brazil, right? Right? Just this past week, we, one of my friends lost a dear childhood friend, a policeman that was killed at the hands of a banjidu. He was only about 30 years old. And in our, t- our church in the evening, we have several policemen, and I think to myself, my gosh, it's only a matter of time before eventually someone, unfortunately, gets killed because the, the stat- statistics are shocking here. And so what do we need to do as pastors, as leaders, as church men and women? We need to identify with those who are going through suffering. And we need to say, I'm with you. And when you're going through suffering, because the more you do that, here's, here's the, the added benefit to that. Not that this should be your motive, but the more you do that, when, others, when you're going through suffering, they're going to be there for you as well. That's just kind of the way it works. So all of this, however, should be. All of what Paul's experienced should put our sufferings in perspective, right? When we get our feelings hurt, when things don't go our way, when someone has a little offense for it towards us, I think we can all look at what the Apostle Paul experienced and say, am I embracing suffering as he does as if there's a gospel purpose in it? And so in the passage that we're about to read this morning, Paul shows us how to handle suffering as if it has a purpose. And it does have a purpose. Because we know that God works out all things for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. We know that God uses even what people intend for us for bad for the good. And so let's stand as we read this passage, First, first Philippians Sorry, first Philippians. I'm not creating a second Philippians. There's only one Philippians. Philippians 1, 12 through 19 this morning. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that's what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So look at that. Paul's saying, what's happening here is causing good things, friends. That's what he's saying from the very beginning. 
As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether false motives are true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I will rejoice. I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what's happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Amen? You may be seated. So as I said before, and this phrase is important, one of the greatest challenges that we face is the threat of our confidence in the goodness of God when we suffer. And therefore, one of our greatest needs as Christians is to have our faith, our belief, our confidence strengthened to know that God in his mercy orchestrates all things for his purposes and for our good. And so we need to have confidence to know that God can transform even the worst of situations into opportunities for the cause of the gospel. And this passage is a great illustration of that. And so first, how do we know that Paul was in prison? I mean, how did he get there? In Acts 22, we first learned that he was arrested, he was thrown in prison. His enemies wanted to assassinate him. As a matter of fact, his enemies hated him so much that they took an oath that they would not eat or drink until he was dead. I mean, that's people who hate you, right? (laughs) And so in this passage in Philippians, the cool thing about Paul is he doesn't even whine. I mean, he doesn't even spend time sort of whining about his situation. He doesn't even explain what happened. He merely says this, what happened to me? which I find is interesting. He has no self-pity. There's no complaining. There's no whining. There's no griping about the Romans. There's no bitterness towards other Christians. There's no resentment towards God because, God, you're the one that caused this. He doesn't do any of that. Now, contrast all of that with us because our tendency so oftentimes is to say, why me, God? Why me? Why me? Por que, Dios? Por que? Oftentimes, for oftentimes, the smallest things. Speaking of small things, I, I, I remember when I was in college, and I was a senior in college, and I was a starter on the men's volleyball team, and I've shared with you some of you before, my dad hated the fact that I played volleyball because he was a wrestling coach, and uh, he didn't think it was, you know, whatever, the best sport, but I was good. Uh, and, and so I played at the college level, and I was a starter, and we traveled all over and played a lot of matches. In my senior year, I was even more valuable, and so we were winning a lot of games. We were on track to go to nationals, and I felt like a million bucks. And then just right in the middle of the season, what ended up happening was this. My shoulder, which is important in volleyball, because you do this, right, just kind of went out. In the middle of the season, just went out, stopped working, which is kind of ridiculous for someone with 22 years old. And I ended up not being able to play for the whole rest of the season. And I was so frustrated. And you have to understand, this was like my world was coming. I was playing volleyball like every day, basically. It was my final year. And it's not the kind of thing that you're going to be able to really do professionally, you know. And so I was like, God, why would you allow that to happen? And so later on, I figured out why. Because I was also leading a campus ministry at the time. I was involved in leadership. I was technically the president or whatever of our organization. And and, and at that time, I kind of had made volleyball more important than my campus ministry. And and so I hadn't made any time for for really discipling others, for developing other leaders, to think about who's going to lead the ministry next year when I was gone. And I had neglected all of that to focus on volleyball. And, and, And so it may sound like a small thing, But when you're in college and you're in that kind of situation, it's a big thing, right? And I was asking, why me, Lord? I was kind of wallowing in the self-pity. And then I saw his response. Because I'm calling you to evangelize. I'm calling you to disciple. I'm calling you to raise up leaders. And and God knew what he was doing. Now, there may have been other reasons in God's mind. I don't know. But that's what 
I perceived. And I can't, exp- I can't compare this experience with Paul's experience, but beha- perhaps I can compare it with yours. When you suffer, the question is this. Do you realize that it's a part of God's sovereign plan? Do you realize it's a part of God's sovereign plan? Or are you always saying, why me? Why me? Why me? And Paul doesn't do that. He knows that what he's experiencing is part of God's sovereign plan. And he knows that it's going to actually cause more people to embrace the gospel. And so, basically the point that Paul's making is this. Anything can be turned around for the glory of God. Anything can be redeemed for the glory of God. That's what Paul is teaching them. He's saying, these things that you're experiencing may seem terrible. They may, they may seem to be straight from the devil himself. But don't believe for a minute that God can't turn around your situation and use it for his glory. Those things that seem to be bringing you only defeat can be turned around to be used for God's glory. In verse 15, Paul refers to those who preach out of false motives. They're basically preaching to bring problems for him. They're doing ministry out of false motives. And some of you may say, well, who in the world would do that? And I would say, well, you haven't been around pastors and leaders very long. (laughs) They're all over the place. They minister out of jealousy. They minister out of frustration. They minister to get something bigger than someone else. Sometimes they sort of curtail biblical principles to try to grow a church, even though they know that they're not really preaching the full gospel. But there's all kinds of reasons that people minister, and many times they have false motives. And the truth is, all of us have a tendency to have false motivations from time to time. And Paul's saying this, whether for false motives or not, I'm thankful that the gospel is being preached. What a mature sort of response, right? That's a mature response. He was laser focused on the gospel. He knows that all things work out for the good that God has called. He knows that we see later in the scriptures that what God, God will use what people intend for our harm for our good. And that should encourage us this morning. And so perhaps you're in a situation where someone is envious of you. Perhaps you're in a situation where you feel like someone's jealous of you where someone only wants to kind of create problems for you, where someone wants to irritate you. And I want to encourage you this morning, God knows their hearts. And if for some reason they're preaching the gospel while they're doing that, God's going to work it out for the good. Because God can use anything. He can turn around anything for his good. There's all kinds of examples of this in the scriptures. Think of Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers, right? I mean, they like sold him into slavery. They didn't want him around. He was kind of like the golden boy of the father, but he certainly wasn't of his brothers. Later on, he became kind of the right-hand man of the king. And, and then as things kind of come around, I mean, it's sort of a form of biblical karma. I'm not saying I believe in karma, but it, it, things come back around, right? And his brothers one day are basically in front of Joseph, and they're in a situation where they're desperate, and he has every right to condemn them, and what does he do? He doesn't condemn them. As a matter of fact, he says this, what you intended for me was evil, but God used it for good and for the saving of many lives. And so some of us this morning need to be reminded that God is in the business of redeeming stories. God is in the business of redeeming stories. He will and he can turn around complicated situations for his glory. Probably the best example of this is Jesus on the cross, right? I mean, what happened to Jesus? Judas betrayed him. All of the disciples around him basically negated him. False witnesses came forward to falsely accuse him. And the greatest tragedy, the greatest injustice and evil in the history of the world was created, which was Jesus being crucified on the cross. And God, in his mercy, used it for much good and for the saving of many lives, including my life. 
And so how someone being crucified could change the story of all humanity is beyond belief, if you really think about it. Because we're so familiar with the cross and the idea of the crucifixion, we kind of don't understand that. But if you just kind of separate yourself from it for a minute and think about how someone being crucified on the cross could change the course of history, could change the course of, of, of the lives of more than a billion people, it's incredible. The very means by which Jesus was crucified is the instrument by which God defeated principalities and powers. This is what God does. This is who God is. And so not everything's going to be resolved in this earth. We know that. But one day, we're going to kind of be walking in glory, right? And everything's going to be fully resolved. Everything's going to be fully resolved. One day, all rights are going to be, sorry, all wrongs are going to be righted, all that's crooked is going to be straightened. Justice is going to be had for all, which we all want that, right? Except for when it applies to us. But there's going to be justice for all of us. But until that day, we need to learn to rejoice, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of those hard times. And throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Psalms, we're repeatedly told, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. And so joy is a choice. Joy is a lifestyle. And rejoicing is something that's possible in the midst of suffering. And it's not rejoicing that we're suffering, okay? I'm not saying that we always have to, I mean, that's a mature way to look at it. But I'm not saying that you always have to, oh, like I'm going through cancer, I want to rejoice. But we do need to have a mature perspective and understand that God calls us to have contentment in all circumstances. The reason we rejoice in suffering is that because we rejoice because there's a purpose in it. And that is that God would do something great in it. And that God in his grace would somehow also do something great through us. God is going to use your suffering as a testimony to the world around us. To the world around you. And so here, here's my prayer then this morning. That our suffering would not be purposeless but that it would be purposeful. That we wouldn't waste our hardship. That we wouldn't waste our, our tears. That we wouldn't waste our pain. That we wouldn't waste our, our, our spiritual poverty. That we wouldn't waste our sickness, but that way we would rejoice in everything. Because we know that in everything there's an opportunity for Jesus to be made much of, both in me and through me. Both in you and through you. You see, when, when we as Christians believe this, when we walk in this, it's a powerful testimony to the world around us. I believe that there's no more powerful witness than a Christian who is going through suffering and glorifies God in the midst of us. Because the rest of the time as Christians, sometimes our life isn't so much different. The difference is how we respond to insults, to persecution, to suffering, to calamity, to hard times. That's really what's different. The rest of the time, okay, well, I'm a Christian. Well, let's say I like to surf. Okay, he likes to surf. I like to eat picanha. He likes to eat picanha. I like to do whatever. I like to read. He likes to read. There's a lot in common with you and the unbeliever. What's not in common is how you respond in the context of suffering. Will you be a testimony the better question is, what kind of testimony will you be? And we know the, the church, unfortunately, is full of all kinds of testimonies that don't give a lot of glory to God. And so, it's easy to be a Christian when everything's going well. It's much harder when we're suffering. And that's when a Christian witness takes on power. And so the question that we should really wrestle with this morning is this. Would anybody be more interested in Jesus because of the way that I've acted over the past couple of months? We should pray and think about that. Is our witness fundamentally any different than the witness of the world? Perhaps the only way to demonstrate how different we are is by how we handle hard times. And so Paul's response to his imprisonment, what did it end up doing? It impacted two groups of people. Those on the inside of the prison 
and those on the outside of the prison. To those inside, he has an incredible witness. Many come to Christ. Soldier after soldier is impacted, converted. I'm sure they heard him singing songs in this prison cell. I'm sure they heard him uh, praying for many. I'm sure they heard him recounting. I don't know if he, if he audibly did this or if he actually wrote himself. It was more custom in those days for him to, to say it and someone else to write it out. But he was writing those books. I'm sure they saw him doing that. Many came to Christ in the prison. That's an incredible witness. And to those on the outside, he was a great example as well. His persecution fueled the advance of the gospel because it was an example for everyone. And so the fact that others preached, even with wrong motives, some of them, resulted in people becoming saved because Paul, because Paul knew one thing. The power is not in the messenger. The power is in the message. The power is not in the messenger. The power is in the message of the gospel. And so he's saying, I don't need to be respected or honored as long as the gospel is being advanced. Some of us don't have the purest of motivations in the context of church. Some of us want power. Some of us want to be seen some of us don't always have the best motives, but thankfully God can use even the broken, rebellious, jealous people, even in his church, for his glory. Now, he may rough you up a little bit in the process, but he can use you for his glory. And so Paul's witness has a massive impact both inside and outside the prison, and it ends up encouraging everyone. And so the question is this, would you say that his suffering was worth it? Well, I think the obvious answer was it was. It was worth it. Of course it was. Many people came to Christ. Now, perhaps this morning we're suffering. Perhaps you're suffering with something. And I just want to ask you this morning, is there a purpose in your suffering? Have you found the purpose? Or does it seem like it's kind of purposeless and has caused you to be really discouraged, in some cases perhaps even depressed, without hope. There's someone who can identify with you. It's not necessarily your pastor. Maybe I can't, but there's someone better. That's Jesus, right? And in Isaiah 53, we read that Jesus is a man of sorrows. That's what was prophesied about Jesus that came to pass. He was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, that he left the glories of heaven to enter into the suffering of the earth. That is how humble and good he is. Jesus chose the life that you and I, given the choice, would not have chosen. He chose the life of suffering. He suffered financially. There's many times he didn't have a place to lay his head. That's why the prosperity gospel doesn't make a lot of sense, right? He, he, he suffered physically. On the cross, he suffered emotionally by the betrayal of his friends, relationally in every way, and to a greater depth even than the Apostle Paul, who suffered quite a bit. Yet Jesus' suffering was purposeful. It was not without a purpose. It was not purposeless. So when Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, surely I will be with you until the end of the age, it's true. And when Paul is suffering in prison alone, He's not alone because Jesus is with him. And so therefore, when you and I are suffering, we're not alone because Jesus is with us. Jesus wept with Paul when Paul was weeping. He wasn't physically there, but we know that Jesus wept. And when he suffered, Jesus suffered with him. Jesus says this in John 16. In this world, you will have trouble. I always say that, but it's important to be reminded. Neste mundo todays aflis soints. This is part of our, this is part of our reality. There's going to be suffering, but thank God, God's going to use it for His glory. Thank God, it doesn't have to be without purpose. Thank God that He works it all out for the good of those who love Him. Some of you this morning have suffered at the hand of your father your earthly father. And it's hard for you to overcome that. And Father's Day may even be a difficult day for you. And I want to just encourage you to do what you can to forgive. You've already suffered greatly. Perhaps God has used that suffering to form you into a person 
that can identify with others in the context of that kind of suffering. Perhaps this morning you're going through other kinds of suffering, relational suffering, financial suffering. Perhaps there's issues with your job, perhaps there's issues in your family or with your spouse. In this world, we're going to have trouble, but take heart. Why? Because there's one who has overcome the world, and his name is Jesus. And so you can read all the self-help books you want. You want to know why there's so many self-help books? Because at the end of the day, they fundamentally don't work. (laughs) So they just keep churning them out year after year after year. You can read all those self-help books, but you can't help yourself because there's only one that can help you, and his name is Jesus. And so this morning, I just want to ask us to pray together, for you to, to bow your head and to close your eyes this morning. And I want to pray this morning that if you're suffering, that you'll suffer well. And for those of us who don't feel like we are suffering, that we could identify with those who are, that we could pray for them, that we could love on them. And for those of us who are, that we would understand that suffering makes us more like Christ when we see the purpose in it. So let's pray this morning. Father, would you help us this morning to not waste our suffering? Would you help us this morning to use our suffering, to to, to see something good happen in us as a result of it? For some of us, the suffering has cost us greatly. We pray this morning, Lord God, that we would not waste it, but that we would invest it in the kingdom, that we would, we would see the gospel spread, that we would see people come to know you as a result of our suffering, that we would be an incredible testimony. And Father, we pray that you would give us joy and contentment, even in the midst of hard times. We thank you, Father, that on this Father's Day here in Brazil, that we can look to you as our Heavenly Father, the one who is perfect, and say, you have everything I need, Abba Father. You provide everything that I need. I don't need to look to the world for anything, because in you, I truly have everything. And so for those of us maybe who don't have a relationship with Jesus, the question is, do we know that Heavenly Father? My prayer is this morning that we would reveal ourselves, that he would reveal himself to us this morning who don't know him. We thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We thank you, Father God, that you bring purpose to our suffering. And we thank you, Father God, that we don't have to be ashamed when we're going through hard times, but to know that there's a purpose in it, and you will help us to discover it. Thank you, Father. And so we pray for this morning. We pray this morning for people who are going through all kinds of difficult situations inside and outside our church. We ask, oh God, that you would bring comfort, that you would bring joy, that you would bring contentment. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship this morning.
His grace is sufficient, and so we can be thankful for it this morning for those of us who are going through hard times, and even good times, because we know that His mercies are new every morning, and we experience His grace and mercy every day, whether we're content or not. Amen?